All right, my friends, I don't remember if I told you the story, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. The story is that in the time of the Tsar, this is the last Tsar of, uh, I think Nicholas was the last one, was it? Alexander, I think Alexander, he was the last Tsar. <clears throat> this was when the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was just a young man. His father passed away in 1920. His father was the fifth Rebbe of Chabad. In 1920, that was pretty much when the, the, uh, the, the whole czar, the whole, what is it? The czarist regime fell, pretty much. I don't know when they, when they killed Alexander. I think it was in 1920. I don't know. Anyway, so they killed him. Okay, but before they killed him, so he was ruthless, 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 terrible person. And he had terrible, and that's why one of the reasons for the, the revolution, not that the communists were any better, the communists were worse, but nevertheless, so he had a, a minister called Stalipin. And Stalipin was just a terrible murderer. And uh, he hung people. He would hung people regularly. It was Stalipin's necktie, they called it. He would hang people in the streets. And he was a big anti-Semite. He hated the Jews. So he made a decree against Jewish education. <clears throat> and the, the, it was instituted, I think, that the Jews, all the Jewish rabbis would have to receive a... Uh, uh, a, um, uh, a diploma from university. There's several stories, by the way, which are like this with the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. There's one with a guy called Karpas, but this is a different story. So the decree was going to be uh, signed and stamped and was waiting. So the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, the, the previous Rebbe's father, he sent the previous Rebbe, he said, you go into Petroburg and I want you to rescind this decree, get it annulled. So he said, okay. So he went to Petroburg and he wandered around in the city and he looked for people that could be of some help and he didn't, all the doors were closed. He just couldn't find anybody. He talked to the Chabad Hasidim there. Nobody knew anything. No one could possibly have any effect on this Stalipin to stop the decree. So he came back home to his father, and his father was uh, standing there with his tzitzis over his shoulder. Shoulder, here, let me show you how this goes. Anyway, I'll show you one second. The tzitzis were over his shoulder. Ah. Here, like this. And his father was looking through the tzitzit like this, see? He was looking through the tzitzit, standing up. He was looking at the tzitzit like this. He came in and he said to his father, he wanted to say to his father that, you know, I failed. I couldn't do it. So his father said that I have it from the, from my father, that he heard it from his father, that the tzitzit of the garment, they come from the garment and they blind the eyes of the forces of evil. They blind the eyes of the forces of evil. And in that merit, you can uh, rescind the decree. So he, he said to his father, how much should I be willing to sacrifice? And his father said, even to the point of death, you should be willing to give your life for this. He said, okay. And so he went back to Petroburg, and there was a big, uh, a rich Jew there. His name was Baron Ginsburg. I think he was a Jew. Anyway, he was a rich Jew. And he had a lot of influence. So he went and he visited him. And he said, listen, I got an idea. There is a big professor, an old professor. And his, he used to teach the Stalipin. Maybe you can convince him to allow you to get in. And this professor is not an anti-Semite, an anti-Semite, not at all. Maybe you can go, I'll introduce you to him. Maybe that'll be an open. <clears throat> and he says, I happen to know that this professor, he can get at the Stalipin whenever he wants. He was his teacher. I said, okay, maybe it'll help. So he goes to this professor and they introduce him and he's 
talking to the professor. I guess that the previous Rebbe must have been a young man at the time, maybe 20, in his 20s. So he and the professor had this conversation together. And they conversed for, you know, half an hour, the professor. And the professor said, I, I had such a wonderful time speaking to you, because the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was a very deep person, and he also knew uh, about the, you know, different philosophies and different, you know, aspects of the world. He was a very worldly, uh, you know, open-minded person. <clears throat> so the, the professor said, you know, I just I had such a wonderful time talking to you. And <clears throat> please do me a favor, come back tomorrow. Should you made me feel young again? So I said, okay. So he came back the next day and they talked again, a wonderful conversation. And the professor said, I notice in your eyes that you're sad. What are you sad about? He said, because there's this terrible decree that Stalipin wants to make, and I have to find out a way to negate the decree. So the professor said, oh, Stalipin, he was a pupil of mine. You know, he really likes me, but he's a terrible person. Terrible, terrible person. He says, there's, nothing's going to change his mind. He's very stubborn. And he's very cruel. And I don't know what to do. So the Rebbe said, listen, could you do me a favor, please? I just want to get in to see him. I said, oh, no, he's not going to talk to you. There's no way. I said, but you know what? I'm willing to do this for you. I have a card. And this card is a note from Stalipin that says to let me in. So you show this card to the guards. The guards don't know who I am. They don't know who I am. I don't go to see Stalipin very often, but I have this card. But one thing is, is if you get caught, I'm going to tell them that you stole it from me. I'm going to tell them that you were in my office and that you stole it from me, that we spoke. We said, okay, good. So he gave him, he gave him this card. And he's a religious Jew. You know, he's a, he got, got a beard and everything. And he came to the guards, the guards standing at the, you know, the, the big offices, wherever it is in, in Petersburg. And the guards look at them, see a religious Jew shows them this card, they let him in. So he's in this huge, this huge halls and, you know, the, 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 the czar had infinite amount of money. And the big halls with big, you know, ceilings and, you know, and people running around in the halls and everything is marble and, and this and there's, you know, with huge tapestries and all of them. And, and he looks around and looks, goes, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, he just calmly goes and he looks at all the doors to see Stalipin's name, which room is his, and he doesn't find it. So he goes up these stairs to the next floor and he sees someone come <clears throat> out of an office. And he has this intuition that that's Stalipin. That must be him. So he goes to the office and he sees, sure, sure enough, his name is written on the door and he opens up the door and he goes inside and there's no one there. There's no secretary at all. And he sees on the table that there's two piles of papers. One pile of papers is papers that he already looked at. And the other pile of papers are papers that he has to certify, stamp. So he's looking through the papers and in the ones that are already stamped, he doesn't care about. He's looking for the ones that were not stamped. He looked for, and sure enough, he found, he found the decree. And he took out the, there was a stamp on his desk, negated, that he, right, uh, rescinded, whatever it is. And he stamped it and he put it in the middle of the pile of things that had already been stamped. And he left. And he wasn't caught. If, if Stalipin would have come in, he would have had him killed immediately. But for some reason, nobody noticed him. He came. And amazingly, according to Stalin, Stalipin's great dismay, as the decree didn't go through, they were supposed to be presented to the Tsar, and the Tsar was supposed to this, and the decree didn't go through. So the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe risked his life for Jewish education, and he did it because his father told him that if you risk your, you're willing to risk your life for Jewish education, that the commandments, the tzitzit, in other words, the, the power of God's will of Judaism will blind the eyes of the forces of evil that they won't see you. And so it was. And so it should be also with all of our enemies. Last night I went to a, an army base. These were, it was a, a combat soldiers. 
nicest people. You figure combat soldiers and all these guys would be like, you know, with the fierce looking and they would, all they were thinking about was just, you know, murder and they were just practicing, you know, throwing knives all the time. I mean, if you would meet one of these guys in the street, you would never dream that this is a, you know, a combat soldier. <clears throat> and they were dancing and they was happy and they were just the, the whole attitude of the people, you know, that they that were there. <clears throat> that, um, you know, the Jewish people, what they want is a good world. They want a world that brings out the good potential in every human being and to show how precious life is. And that's what this battle is. It's a battle of life and meaning against death and nihilism. And that's why, by the way, uh, all these leftists in America, all the woke and the LGBTQ, and other, they join together with the Hamas. And the Hamas is exactly the opposite. Hamas hates all these guys. They hate all these, the, the LGBT, they throw them off the buildings. They can't stand them. They hate them. Everything these people stand for, the Hamas is against. Right? They're, they're, they're the most bigoted people in the world, the Hamas. I mean, if you're talking about you know, racial cleansing, the Hamas, they want to destroy anyone who doesn't accept Muhammad. You know, that's just like you know, fierce, insane, uh, <clears throat> what are they, fanaticism. You know, the opposite of free thinking of this. So what do they have in common? They have in common death. All these LGBT, all these letters stand for death, ways to misuse the power of procreation for your own, so they won't give birth to children. And the, the BLM, no police, everybody do what you want to, no law and order, death, confusion, destruction. But they have no positive platform whatsoever. Just pure death. It's really quite incredible. And hopefully, what this is doing now. Who put these Hamas people there? The Israelis, the Zionists, that they also have no purpose in life. Their purpose is just to have a good time. You know, just leave me alone. They're not serving anybody. They're not. They come to Hamas and they say, we're the chosen people. The land of Israel belongs to us. It was from ours. It's time immemorial. They never, they, they, we were always here. It's our land. You pushed us out. And what do the, what do the Zionist Jews say? We were here first, it was before 48, but there was this and we were that. We, 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 all we want to do is uh, coexist. We don't, what do you coexist? What do you drink a cup? God gave us the land. God, God, God creates the world. It's the first Rashi in the Chumash. God creates the world. The world belongs to Him. That's the beginning. That's who was here first. Who was here first was God. Who are God's people? Oh, that's that's the argument. Who are God's people? But who did God give the land to? There is a good argument. But not who no, that's what the, the should be the argument between the, 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 the Zionists and the, the, the Hamas should be who did God give the land to? But what does Hamas say? God gave the land to us. And what did what did the Zionists say? Herzl gave the Balfour gave the land to us. Who needs Balfour? Who is Herzl? But it's changing, it's changing, it's changing, my friends, it's changing. And that the tzitzis are blinding the eyes of the opposite forces. And suddenly start, everyone's starting to realize that God gave the land of Israel to the Jews, and God is creating everybody. God loves everyone. He's creating everyone in the world from love. Life is precious. That's the message of Jews to the world. Life is precious. And then if you're not like me and you don't believe in me, that's because the way God gave it to you. That's the way God made you. So you have to work on yourself. You have to convince yourself. You have to think about it. God Does God exist? Does he not exist? Is the Torah true? Is it not true? <clears throat> but think about it. That's the battle that's going to be inside of everybody. That's the battle that's going to be inside. And God willing, for sure, Hashem will win. Hashem Ayeshua. Have a good day. God bless you all with Mashiach now. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Let's stop recording.